she's a management and program analyst in the outreach branch of a U.S. Citizen and Immigration Services Verification Division in Los Angeles, which is also the part of the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, I met Yu Ting at a PIRA event, Professions and Human Resource Association event in Burbank, where she gave this presentation, and I thought it was such a great presentation. I wanted to open it up to our clients and prospects. Um, she uh, educates employers and the public on programs supported by the Verification Division, including E-Verify, the Form I-9, and My E-Verify. Um, prior to joining the outreach branch of the Verification Division, division um, she was a lead analyst in the customer contact operation within the division. And prior to that, she worked in various industries of the Department of Defense, insurance industry, education, and military service. Um, Yu Ting proudly served in the Army and was deployed in Iraq during Operation Iraqi Freedom. Uh, and she earned her master's degree in psychology at Cal State Fullerton. Um, so on that note, I'm going to turn it over to Yu Ting, and I am going to go on mute as much as I can. So take it away. Sounds perfect. Thank you, Barry. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Yu Ting again. Thank you for that introduction. So today we will focus on Form I-9, and I'll kind of go into a little bit on E-Verify as well. I know some of you may be using E-Verify, and we'll talk about what it is. Maybe you heard about it, kind of want to know what that is. We'll cover a little bit on that. And then I'll introduce my E-Verify a little bit for you. So today in this presentation, you'll get a little bit of information on all three, but we will focus on Form I-9. Um, and that is because Form I-9 is a required form. Um, this is nothing new. I've been to a lot of presentations recently, and people start asking, is it because the new um, political environment or um, the new administration now that we need to do this form? And that's, n that's not the case. Form I-9 has been around since 1986, and it is because the part of um, Immigration Reform and Control Act IRCA in 1986, and IRCA says as employers, you do have responsibility to make sure that you're hiring people who are eligible to work in this country. So when you get a copy of this presentation later on, um, just a note here, anything that you see with the red hyperlink down below, all these are um, hyperlinks. They're taking you to additional information. If you want to read more about IRCA, kind of find out how it came about, feel free to click on them and you'll read more information on that. So basically, IRCA says as employers, you can't um, really hire people who are not eligible to work knowingly. Um, and Form I-9 is really a tool that came from IRCA to help employers determine who can actually work in the United States. So there are different kinds of people who can work in the United States. We have four categories here on your screen. The first one is citizens of the United States. So these are people who um, maybe they were born here, or maybe they gone through some kind of naturalization process, or they're derived citizens. So they are citizens. They can work indefinitely. They have voting rights. And then we also have non-citizen national of the United States. And these are individuals who um, were born in territories of the United States. They don't have certain rights like voting rights, but they can, they can work in this country indefinitely. Um, and an example would be someone who's born in, let's say, American Samoa, um, Swings Island, so people who were born in the ter territory and they can work. And then the third one is lawful permanent residents. So these are green card holders. And later on in the presentation, I'll share a lot of um, examples and common mistakes I see with employers when they complete the Form I-9. Um, and lawful permanent resident is one of the categories that I will address. There is some misunderstanding about what kind of documentation you need from lawful permanent residents. Um, so we'll definitely address that. You will see some permanent residents would have a two years green card. Some of them will have 10 years green card. Some of them won't even have expiration date on their permanent residence card. And we'll talk about how to handle the case um, when you have a lawful permanent resident. The last category here is aliens authorized to work. And I get a lot of questions on this um, when I go to presentations. So these 
are people who are um, from another country. So asylees, refugees, they fall under aliens authorized to work. Um, your company may be petitioning for workers to work for you, so H-1B workers, or maybe you have foreign students from another country who can work for a shorter period of time, a specific period of time. These are all aliens authorized to work. So that's the four categories of workers who can legally work in the United States. Now, next, this is your responsibility as employers. Number one, you got to know who you're hiring. So you'll have to verify the identity of the individual, and you'll have to check the employment authorization of your employee. And this is anyone you hired after November 6, 1986, because that's when Air Club actually uh, became a law. So if you have someone you hired prior to that, that's more than um, about 30 years ago, then you're not responsible for their Form I-9. Um, a lot of time we go to companies and employers always say, the HR person would say, hey, you know, we ask for two forms of ID every time someone came on board. And when we talk about two forms of ID for Form I-9 purpose, we're really talking about something that identifies your identity and employment authorization. So there are some cases like a U.S. passport that gives you the identity of the person and it also gives you employment authorization. So we want to be really careful when we're dealing with documentation because as employers, you're supposed to complete this Form I-9 without discriminating against anyone. And this is the point where most employers would say, I don't plan on discriminating against anyone. That's never our focus, and we would never do that. Well, there are some situations where employers would accidentally do something and they just didn't know that's part of discrimination. So the first one we have here, citizenship or immigration status discrimination. Sometimes we see job postings where the company would say preferred U.S. citizen or prefer green card holders on their job posting. If there's no specific law that allows your company to post a position like that, then it could be considered a citizenship or immigration status discrimination. Um, the second one, national origin discrimination. Some company would say, you know, I prefer workers from a specific country. Um, a technology company would say, you know, most of my workers here are, in fact, from for example, India. So I would like to hire someone who will better fit my company culture. So I prefer someone from India. Well, that could be considered as national origin discrimination. The third one is the most common one um, when it comes to Form I-9 process, document abuse. So this includes an employer says, just to be safe, I want to see all your immigration documentation because you identify yourself as um, a, maybe a lawful permanent resident or alien authorized to work, I want to see all the documentation you have with immigration so I can be sure you're eligible to work. Or some employer asking permanent residents for their green card specifically after a permanent resident already provided them a driver's license and social security card. Um, so sometimes employers would ask for more documentation than is needed for this Form I-9 process, and this can all trigger an audit um, or a claim against the employer to say, hey, I'm not being treated fairly. My employer is not asking a U.S. citizen for additional documentation, but they are asking me for additional documentation just because of my immigration status. Um, so document abuse, another huge one that we want to be careful about. Lastly, retaliation. So let's say an employee has a little bit of HR background, which is they've done their research on Form I-9 and came up and say, you know, I, I don't think you should be asking me for my permanent residence card. I don't have to provide that to you. And um, an HR person turn around and say, well, if you don't want to give that to me, then you don't have to work here or we will withhold pay until you give me the documentation that I specifically asked for, um, or you're not going to any training until I see it. That's all considered retaliation, and employee, again, can file a complaint against you. And the department, they were, they were, 
Okay, I'm sorry. I'm hearing a little bit of um, echoing. Uh, so. That was probably because of me, and I'm going to hang up in a second. But uh, I forgot to mention to anybody, if anybody has any questions during the presentation, please type in your question on the bottom uh, of the screen on the left side, and then you can, can see the questions and answer them. And I'll go back on mute. Awesome. Thank you, Barry. Good point. Yes, please, please get your questions. We, I hope to answer your questions um, if we can in this session. And also you have my contact information. If you really need help, I'll also give you our resources towards the end. So thank you, Barry, for that. Um, the next slide here, this is the immigrant, immigrant and employee rights section, IER. This is the department where employee can call and file a complaint against the employer. And this type of complaint will also trigger um, a lot of times an audit. So some, if an employee calls and say, you know, my employer is asking everyone for a list A, B, and C document, which we'll talk about later on, on every single form I night, or only for uh, people from another country, I would like you to look into that. This is the department that they call um, and find out about what to do next. And also there is an employer's hotline that you see on this slide. So let's say your company has some kind of policy, you're just not 100% sure on whether or not that's, you know, at the borderline of discriminating against someone, you just want to be on the safe side, go ahead and give IER a call. These are lawyers, attorneys, they're, they're on the line answering your questions. And if you're not comfortable giving out your company information, you can even remain anonymous when you call. Um, so this is another great resource you can tap into if you have questions about um, a certain practice as to if it's discriminating against someone or not. So next, let's jump back a little bit to the I-9 requirements. So we know there is a new form I-9 that came out last year, November 14 of last year. And there's sort of this grace period between November 14 to January 22nd, where you could still use the 2013 version of the form. But at this point in June, you should all be using the most current form um, with a revision date of November 14, 2016. You can delegate someone to complete the form for you. So I get a lot of questions where employer would say, you know, my office is here in California, but I have clients in another state in Arizona and I'm hiring individuals in Arizona. How would I complete the Form I-9? Someone needs to examine Form I-9 documentation. As an employer, you can always designate someone else to complete the form for you, but just know that you are responsible at the end of the day um, for the information on this form I-9. So if you are going to have your hiring managers, your office manager, or someone else at the location to complete the form for you, make sure they're properly trained on how to complete the form. Otherwise, when you try to go back and make, uh, make corrections, it would be quite a bit of work. And I'll cover how to make corrections later on as well. The next slide here, I'm showing you what the Form I-9 looks like. Um, I know it's really small, but the Form I-9 is available online. And it's, I just want to show you, it is still two pages. But on top of two pages, we have 15 pages of instructions, one page of list of accessible documents, and 60, 69 pages of the user manual. So that is a lot of information for two pages of the form. And that's why this kind of training is definitely helpful because you are required to complete it. There is a fine associated with not completing the forms correctly or actually hiring someone who's not eligible to work. The enforcing agency for the Form I-9 is ICE. Immigrant, immigration custom enforcement. So they could do an audit on your Form I-9. And this is why we're coming out here to give you the education to help you fill out the Form I-9 before your company audited. There are some exceptions um, when it comes to Form I-9. There are some situations you just don't have to complete a Form I-9. Um, so for example, if I want to have, let's say a babysitter comes in and babysit my children for a few hours, um, the work is at my household and it's sporadic, irregular. I don't necessarily need to complete a Form I-9 for that worker. 
Um, so that's one exception. Another one would be independent contractors whom you don't set the work hours or provide tools for. Um, so maybe you have um, a contractor who comes in and fix your plumbing for one or two times. You're not responsible to complete a plumb by night for that person. Um, or maybe your company has a contract with a cleaning crew and the person who comes in and clean your office, they're really employees of another company. You are not responsible to complete um, a form I-9 for them. Lastly, if your company is really across different countries, maybe you have offices in Canada or Mexico, and these individuals are hired in another country and will be working in another country, you don't have to complete a Form I-9 for our worker. Now, if you hire someone here in the United States, and maybe the person's gone through a couple weeks of training, and then the person would work in another country, you may still be responsible for that Form I-9 because when the person's getting trained, if that person's getting paid and it's considered work, then you will be responsible for the Form I-9. So in the next few screens, we will go into each section of the form. Um, so I'll, I'll highlight some of the major changes that happened from the previous version and um, the version that was just released um, November of last year. So this is section one of the form. So one of the additions that we made um, is this little blue question mark next to each field. These little blue question marks, they are helper text. It helps employees to find out what information needs to go into each field. Um, so they're really helpful, and that's part of the reason why when you pull up the form on a computer, it looks like it's actually two, um, I'm sorry, three pages of the form, but when you print it out, it's really two pages um, because these little blue question marks, they do take up space. Um, so they, that's one of the functions we add to our form. Another thing that we change is this box right here. It says other last names used. We used to want to know any other legal names used, even first name. And that's been changed to only last name. We only care about legal last names now. So that's um, great for some employees. Everything you see on this slide right here, Section 1 Employee Information, every box should have some kind of information in there, meaning that if I don't have a middle initial, it should be an A under middle initial. If I don't have a apartment number, I should have an A under apartment number. The only exception is this U.S. Um, Social Security number field. A Social Security number on Section 1 of the Form I-9 is not a required field unless your company participates in E-Verify. So some employees may not want to give you their social security number on section one of the form. Don't force them to input that number there unless your company participates in E-Verify, then you can ask for it. And there's a lot of reasons for that. People will say, you know, I just, I want to protect my identity. The less places I can put my social security numbers on, that, the better. That's completely fine. Um, so make a note of that definitely. Email address and phone numbers, there are still optional fields, but again, you need to have NA on there if the employee chooses not to give you any information there. Continue on with Section 1. So on this screen, there are these sort of the four citizenship status that um, we discussed earlier. And employee would make their selection. They would tell you what their citizenship status, whether you're a citizen or non-citizen national, they're lawful permanent resident or alien authorized to work. When you complete the form on a computer, it re it's really helpful because an employee would not be able to select multiple statuses. Um, I've seen some form I night in the past where employee would say, well, I'm a U.S. citizen now, but I will also check lawful permanent resident because that's my status before that. And after that, I also would check alien authorized to work because that was my status before that. I want to give you as much information as possible. They should not do that. They should choose their current immigration status. And based on their selection, there are more information they may have to provide to you. For example, on the screen here, lawful permanent resident, they would choose whether they're giving you an alien number or US CIS number on section one of the form. This is the portion where employee gives you that information. You don't need to see any documentation yet. 
Um, that's another common mistake we see. An employer would say, well, the employee choose lawful permanent resident with this number, so I want to see documentation to verify what they put on Section 1 is correct, um, and you're not supposed to do that because that would be over-documenting. Again, um, alien authorized to work, they also have options to input their alien authorized to work and what information they want to give you, either alien number or I-94 number or foreign passport number. When you download this form on, the, uh, on our website, we don't allow electronic signatures yet. Now, there are a lot of companies out there now that may have created an electronic form I-9, allows electronic signatures. Um, that may still be fine as long as they're within the guideline. But when you download the form on our website, you do need to print it out and have the employee sign it. Um, section one of the form is completed no later than the first business day for employment. So that means if I hire someone, the person start working on Monday, by the end of Monday, I will need to have um, section one of the form completed. So you can always give employee instructions. I mean, you can, uh, even after you offer a job to the person, you can give them a form I-9 for informational purpose. That's completely fine. The earliest time you can complete a form I-9 is after an employee accepts a job offer, um, but no later than the first business day, section one of the form would need to be, be completed. And I want to mention that because there are a lot of companies, um, sometimes they're doing a lot of hiring every day. Um, so it's a little bit difficult to try to get all that information on the same day. Or maybe the employee would show up to work and not really knowing their citizenship status because they may be in between or they're not really sure what documentation they have. So it would be a good idea to provide them this information um, beforehand and just so they come in prepared um, so that there's nothing wrong with that. Now, Form I-9 cannot be part of your hiring application, though, meaning that you can say, well, based on your Form I-9 information, then I will decide if I want to give you a job or not, because then that would be considered discrimination. You shouldn't be determining whether you want to hire someone or not based on their immigration status. So I just want to point that out. Now, next screen here, this is the last section of Section 1. It used to be, if you don't use the prepare and translator, you sort of just leave that box blank and move on to the next page. Well, we changed that with this version of the Form I-9. Employee would actually have to make a selection and say, I do not use the prepare and translator if they didn't use the prepare or translator. Um, employees, if they, they did use the prepare and translator, and a lot of time they do because this form needs to be kept in English version. Unless you're located in Puerto Rico, well, then yes, the Spanish version will be, you, you'll be able to keep a Spanish version. But otherwise, it's only English version. So sometimes employees would need to have someone translating this information for them. And maybe as an employer or maybe the HR staff want to help typing out the information, that's all considered prepare and translator. So you can have multiple prepare and translators for section one of the form. If you select that I have more than one prepare and translator, an additional page will be generated for you so you can enter additional information for that second prepare or translator. Um, so that's all on section one. And we'll move on to section two. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in. Even if we skip the section, whatever, we'll, we'll definitely go back and adjust your questions. Um, so feel free to use the chat box down below and I would love to address your questions. Okay, so let's move on to section two. Section two is the point where employer examines documentation. You have a little bit more time to complete section two. We understand people need to find their document, you need to actually see it. Um, so you have until three business days after the employees begin working for pay. So what that means is if someone is hired on Monday, you have until the end of Thursday to complete section two of the form. And one thing we really like about this new revision is that on the top of the section two where you enter employee's name and also their citizenship status, if you want to complete this form 
on the on the computer, the, um, a computer version of the form, this information is automatically filled in for you from section one. And this is because this one section is one of the portion that many forms I nine are missing. So if you were to go home and do an audit on all the previous form I nine, that might be a field to look for. Do I have a name on top? for every single employee form. Um, another addition here is the citizenship and migration status on the top right-hand corner of the form. That is another help, really, really helpful field. Um, so what that number is, this number associated with the number that the employee put on section one of this form. So if someone say, I'm a citizen of the United States, then it will be number one on this field. If I'm a non-citizen national, it will be number two. Permanent resident would be number three. Um, alien authorized to work would be number four. And what this number does is that if the employee provides a documentation that does not match their citizenship status. So for example, if I say I am a lawful permanent resident, but I'm trying to give you an employment authorization card that's issued to alien authorized to work. Um, in that situation, the form will come up with an error message and say, hey, something is not right here. Either the employee selected the wrong status on section one, or what you have in front of you is not really an employment authorization card. And this does help um, to avoid a lot of mistakes that we've seen employers make with the previous version. So that is a very helpful, helpful, helpful field. Um, as employers, you do need to look at the original document. You cannot accept a document via webcam, Facebook, Snapchat, you can't do any of that. We're just talking about how useful technology is now, um, but there are certain things you just can't do um, over a computer. So you have to see the original documentation with the employee present in front of you so you can examine the documentation and make sure the documentation is not expired. And there's a question about should employer keep copy of um, of the two documents. So whether or not to make a copy of a document, this is a really good question. This, this is actually one of the common questions that we get, um, and we will have a slide on that later on as well. It's up to your company policy as to if you want to keep copies of documentation or not. If you choose to make a copy of documentation, you have to be sure you're doing the same across the board. So you can't have a policy and say, I only make copies of documentation for U.S. citizens, but not for lawful permanent resident. Or I only make copies for a certain status of people. You won't be able to do that. Um, but once you have that policy, just make sure you do the same across the board, either making copies for everybody or um, not making copies for anyone. Now, if you participate in E-Verify, there are some exceptions there. And, and we'll talk about E-Verify exceptions later on. That's, that's a really good question. All document needs to be unexpired. Basically, examine the document with the employee present in front of you because you still have the responsibility to feel the document to see if it generally feels legit to me. Now, this page right here, this is list of acceptable documents. So we have three different lists here. So I kind of mentioned before, as an employer, you're looking for identity of the person, and work eligibility of the person. So we have three lists. Under list A, the documentation under list A will tell you both identity and work authorization, like a green card. A green card would have the person's picture, and you know green card, a permanent resident can work, so then you'll be able to accept that as a list A document. One document is good enough. U.S. passport, same situation. Now, list B document only tells you who that person is, but it doesn't tell you if that person can work or not. Like a student ID. Well, if someone's from another country is coming here to study, they can possibly get a student ID as well. Um, or maybe a driver's license. It doesn't necessarily tell you that person can work, it just tells you the identity of the person. Um, so list B document, you can accepted to establish identity. Now, one thing about list B, if your company participates in E-Verify, all your list B document needs to have a picture on it. I want to mention that because you will see there are some items on your list B that doesn't really include a picture, like 
for example, most voters registration card doesn't have a picture on there. Um, so you don't you won't be able to accept a voter registration card if you participate in E-Verify because you need to see a photo ID um, for list B. And list C document tells you that person can work, but it doesn't tell you um, really the identity of the person. Like a social security card, um, on the strictly social security card, it tells you the person's name, the social security number, and the person can legally work. But you can't really associate that card with the employee in front of you. So you need to um, have an identity document to go with that. So you will have to have a list B document. So whenever you're completing the form, it's either one item on the list A or a combination of list B and C. On the list C document, I want to mention um, restricted social security card is not acceptable. What I mean by restricted is any kind of statement on the card that says valid for work only with DHS authorization or INS authorization, or some of them will even say on there not valid for work, um, that kind of verbiage. If you see anything like that, you will not be able to accept that card as a list C document. That restricted card is usually issued issue to individuals who have um, a temporary work status here in the United States. So the card wants to kind of differentiate that. Um, there's no expiration date on the Social Security card. So that's one way Social Security is trying to say there's some restriction here. You won't be able to use this um, as a work authorization document. Now, you are not required to be a document expert. Yes, the employee needs to be present in front of you. Yes, you need to look at the original document and use the best of your judgment to see if that document looks genuine and relates to the individual presenting it. So I had a situation where an employer said, you know, I have this individual in front of me. He's about 55 years old, and he is trying to give me a student ID. But the picture on the ID looks like the person looks like 18 years old, and it does not look like the person. And the date of birth, it, it just doesn't seem to be matching up. Um, I can't tell if the document really relates to the person. Well, in that situation, you do not have to accept that document. Um, so use the best of your judgment to see if the documentation looks genuine and relates to the individual presenting it. You must accept documents if, they, if the document meets the two criteria here. And I want to mention that because I've been to presentations where the employer would say, well, I only accept driver's license and social security cards. And that's just our top company policy because we are only comfortable with driver's license and social security cards. And that would be wrong. We won't be able to, um, that's against the policy to do that because what if the individual doesn't have a driver's license to rent to you? Um, there's no requirement for the person to have a driver's license. Um, and any document they presented under the list of acceptable document that looks genuine and relates to the individual, you must accept it. Okay, so we already mentioned original document, no copy, even if it's color copy, even if it's high quality color, pitch, color printer, we just can't take copies. We have one exception here, certified copy of the birth certificate. And th these are actual documents issued by um, a lot of times the county's offices, these usually would have a raised seal um, into actual documentation. Then you'll be able to accept it. You won't be able to accept a copy of a certified copy of the birth certificate for Form my 9 purpose. Okay, the next screen here, I really want to spend some time here on this one slide. Employment authorization document auto extension. This is the newest um, addition to our manual. And this is the one portion where I start getting a whole lot of questions about um, because it's so new. So in the manual, the handbook for employer M274, um, that's the 69 pages of instructions um, that I mentioned before. In your, man in your manual, there is a list of categories um, of individuals who qualify for this auto extension. It used to be when an alien authorized to work presenting an employment authorization card, when the card is expired, 
they generally can't work anymore because that's how long they're authorized to work. Well, with this new rule, there are certain individuals who fits under the category will have a 180 days extension. So this is what you should do in this type of situation. Number one, you're looking for the category on the employment authorization card. So you want to match that category up with the category that's in your handbook. And there's a list in your handbook. I believe it's on page 12 of your handbook. Okay, so number one, does the category fit under one of those auto extension qualifying categories? Number two, if the category in fact falls under one of the, the qualifying category, then you gotta look for this I-797C. I-797C is a receipt, it's a notice of action to give, given to the employee after they apply for an employment, a new employment authorization card. Um, so number two, you're looking for an I-797C. Number three, on the I-797C, you're checking for a couple of things. You're checking for, one, the category on the I-797C is still the qualifying category. And also, the I-797C is dated prior to the expiration date of their original employment authorization card. And that makes sense. Um, if you wait until your employment authorization has expired and then you apply for a new card, there's nothing to extend. But if you, in fact, applied prior to the expiration date of your card, then, yeah, there, you could qualify for this extension. So, again, when you have an employment authorization card that's expired, you're looking for a few things. So, three things. One is the category on the employment authorization card. Number two is an I-797C. Number three on the I-797C, you're checking for category and the date of the I-797C to be sure it's prior to the original expiration date of the card. Um, so that's the three things to look for. Um, I know this may be confusing to some um, employers and this is one of the newest rules, so definitely let us know if you have more questions about this auto extension. Okay. Let's move on to another type. So we'll talk about receipts. Usually when we talk about receipts with Form I-9, we're talking about an employee will come in and say, hey, this is my social security card. I know you can't see the information on there. It's been through the washer a few times. Um, it's kind of old. It's, it's damaged. I know you can't see it, but can you take this document? Well, you don't have to take a document that's damaged. If you can't tell the information, um, you won't be able to accept that. But the employee will be able to give you a receipt to show that I have applied for a replacement of my document. If my document is lost, stolen, or damaged, you can apply for a receipt. And the individual can show you that receipt within that, the three business, business days time frame. So if someone's hired on Monday, by Thursday, the person needs to show you that receipt you can accept that receipt for up to 90 days from the date of hire. Um, so lost or limb or damaged documents, receipt is fine. You can take that. Um, another type of receipt is an I-94, which is a rival departure record with the I-551 stamp. I-551 is permanent residence, the form number for a permanent residence card. And sometimes a green card takes a while to be processed. There's a lot of security features on the card, so it could take a little while. So in a situation where someone gives you a 994 and I-551 stamp with a picture, you can accept that document for a year. Usually there's an expiration date on the stamp, but if not, it's one year from the date the stamp is issued. And the third type of receipt is I-94, a rapid departure record, with a refugee stamp. You can accept that as well as a receipt for 90 days. So we usually see more of the number one, the lost one or damaged document receipt, um, and two and three we see that sometimes. It, the receipt has to be coming from an originating agency. Um, I had a case in the past where someone went on a website, a dot-com website, um, to see if they can locate a copy of their birth certificate. And they're trying to show a receipt on the website, but the website isn't the issuing authority of a birth certificate then the employer won't be able to accept that kind of receipt. 
Okay, and this is the portion where we talk about documents, copying documentation. So make sure whatever practice you're, you choose to go with, whether to make copies of all documentation or not to make any documentation, just make sure you have a consistent a, a, a policy in place so everyone is being treated fairly. Um, now, you can stop the policy anytime maybe you are making copies of documentation and then now you don't want to do it anymore. You just need to have a, a set date to say, after this day, we're not taking copies anymore. Now, if you participate in Verify, there is this photo matching tool um, that you'll be able to use to be verified. So when you participate in E-Verify, you have additional requirements to make copies of documentation if the employee presented a U.S. passport, passport card, permanent residence card, and employment authorization card. Um, so that's the kind of document you will have to make a copy of if you participate in E-Verify. Let me talk about E-Verify briefly um, in a little bit as well. Okay, so this is the last section of the Form I-9 now. Section three, we're finally coming to the end of the form. Section three of the form is confusing for a lot of employers because you can use section three for so many different things. You can use it for re-verification, you can use it for rehire, or you can use it to update an employee's biographic information. Um, so let's talk about re-verification first. When we talk about re-verification, we're talking about when someone's temporary employment authorization has expired. So we're not talking about driver's license because that's an identity document. We're not talking about a U.S. passport because a U.S. citizen can work in this country indefinitely. It doesn't change their citizenship status. But we are talking about employment authorization cards because when a card is expired, we need to see if there's further authorization that allows the person to work. We are also talking about uh, maybe a foreign passport with an I-94 arrival departure record that has an expiration date. Maybe we are talking about that. So anytime someone's work authorization expires, you will need to make sure that person can still work in the country. And um, again, you don't re-verify identity because the identity of the person generally doesn't change just because their, their ID card has expired. Um, so that's one use of Section 3. Another use is rehire. So if you were to rehire someone within three years from the original completion date of the, the Form I-9, you can use Section 3 to rehire that person instead of completing a whole new Form I-9. Now, some employer really don't want to use Section 3 to rehire someone, and you don't have to use Section 3 to rehire anyone. You can choose to complete a new form every single time. Um, some company, when they only have maybe five employees and it's the same employees coming in and out, using Section 3 might be helpful because it's, it's just easier. It's easier to track. They only have a few employees. Now, if you have multiple employees, you have hundreds of employees, it's a little bit difficult for you to try to find that original form, then determine if it's still within three years, and see if re-verification is needed, because if you also need to re-verify that employee, you have to use the most current version of the form. Then in this situation, we you know the Form I-9 has just updated last year, so you will have to determine, is this even the current form that I can use? Um, so a lot, of, a lot of employers, they would choose to use a new form instead, and that's completely fine. Lastly, you can also update employee's name. So I got married, my last name was Chu, and now it's Adler. So let's say I really, really want my employer to have the up-to-date name on the Form I-9. I could ask my employer to update my name using Section 3 to write in my new last name, um, but that's not really required. A name update is only required if you're also doing re-verification and rehire at the same time. So Section 3, generally, we use it for re-verification, and sometimes you can use it for rehire um, or to update names. And next screen right here, this is a little chart. So you, when you have a copy of this presentation, it might be helpful to you to, to have it for reference um, to find out when you need to re-verify someone. One thing we want to point out, under do not re-verify, we have permanent residence. 
a permanent resident may have a card, and a green card that has a two years expiration date, meaning that they have some kind of condition. They have to remove their condition at some point, or they have 10 years expiration date, meaning that there is no any condition. They're just permanent residents. Um, some of the older cars have no expiration date at all, regardless if the car has an expiration date or not. Permanent residents who present a permanent residence card do not need to be re-verified. Um, sort of like the analogy of U.S. passport, when the passport is expired, that person is still a U.S. citizen. Same thing with permanent residents. Their car, by the time their car expires, it doesn't mean that they lose their status. Um, they may have issues in the future when trying to get benefits, um, but they don't lose their status automatically just because their car is expired. So that's one thing we want to point out because that's the number one um, complaint that we see from employees is that my employer kept on harassing me, asking me for new documentation, and they want me to know, we need to tell them if I'm a citizen yet. And um, we don't want employers to do that. So no re-verification on permanent residence. Now, we all make mistakes. So if you discover a mistake on the form, here's how you can correct it. You can cross off the wrong information, initial and date the change, and then that would be it. If you want to, you can include a memo explaining what happened. You can also, if the correction is just too messy to the point for you to see what's even on the original form, you can also prepare a new form I-9 um, to allow to just complete the form altogether. Um, so that's how you will be able to correct it. Now, uh, we also have cases where you're doing an audit and you realize the previous HR person has never done a form I-9 for you um, or all the files were lost. In that situation, just bring the employee back and have them complete a form I-9 as soon as possible and then you'll be able to complete the form and keep it on file. In that situation, you may want to include some kind of note to say, this is what happened. This is why I didn't have my form. Uh, don't ask the employee to backdate anything. Sometimes employee would say, hey, my employer wanted me to sign it after the day I was hired, but I'm not comfortable lying on the form I night. So don't ask them to backdate anything. So that's the entirety of how to complete the form. Next, we'll talk about how to store the form. It's pretty self-explanatory. A lot of HR people will say, I thought you have to keep the form I not all the forms on a in a separate binder. Um, when you keep a form I not, you are not allowed to keep them um, in employees' file. Well, there's really nothing that says you can't keep a form I nine with employees' file. Um, but it is probably easier for you to keep them separately because if your company gets audited, you receive that audit notice, you only have three business days to come up with all your forms. So you only have three days to collect all the forms and present it to the auditing agency. So it might be easier if you keep them separately, just so you don't have to go through hundreds and thousands of files trying to pull up all these forms. However you store the form is really up to your business practice. On-site, off-site, storage facility, I've seen companies that have just a storage room of Form I-9. They didn't want to destroy anything. They just have a room full of Form I-9. Fine. However we want to store it, that's, that's up to your company. As long as you're keeping them somewhere safe, only authorized people can access that information, and you can present all the information within three days, that's fine. Um, I had a presentation yesterday. Someone asked, what if I want to save them electronically? That is fine as well. You can save your forms electronically, and in that case, you don't have to keep the paper form. As long as, in the case of an audit, you can pull them all up, and there's no issue with locating them or accessing them in the case of an audit. Retention period. This is the minimum time you have to keep a Form I-9 after an employee is terminated. So it's three years after the day you hire a person or one year after the uh, employment is terminated, whichever is later. So if someone's working for me for the past 20 years and quit today, then I will keep that Form I-9 for one additional year. Now, if I hire someone today and they quit tomorrow, then I'll have to keep that Form I-9 for three additional years um, after the day I hired the person. 
So that's the minimum period. Again, you can keep a Form I-9 as long as you want to. Uh, this is the minimum. And when you have a copy of this presentation, we have an example down below for you, so you can kind of plug in the dates and determine how long you have to keep a form. Okay, so we're coming to the end of the presentation. I want to mention eVerify. It kind of tells you how it works. So eVerify is a free web-based system that allows you to check for my night information. You will use eVerify once you sign up. Use it on all your new hires or any existing employees assigned to a federal contract. Usually, employers will sign up and use it on their own employees, or there are some services out there now that they would have an employer agent service where they would sign up and conduct e verify verification for their clients. So there are different ways you can use e verify depending on your business needs. And it checks Department of Homeland Security and Social Security's records. And e verify is really something you want to do to help reduce unauthorized employment. So a lot of employee, employer would say, you know, I'm using the best of my judgment to complete the form, but I'm not a government. I don't, I don't know if information is actually matching. So eVerify is giving employer that access to say, yes, this is how you can check this information. It's fairly easy to use, so you can get that quick response back. And if there is an issue, employee will be given time to resolve the issue. So this is how it works. Employee will still complete the Form I-9. Form I-9 will, information will be submitted into E-Verify. And then E-Verify will check Social Security Administration to pick things out like Social Security number is an invalid Social Security number, or name mismatch, or citizenship status mismatch. Social Security will pick up this kind of issue and let the employee know. Department of Homeland Security will also do their check on maybe this worker can only work for a specific employer. Maybe there's something wrong with the employment authorization. Um, DHS would pick up that kind of issue. A lot of times you get employment authorized response back, meaning everything's good, there's no problem. Sometimes you'll get verification in process to say we need a little bit more time to look into this case. Lastly, we'll get tentative non-confirmation, meaning that there's something that's not matching up. After an employee receives a tentative non-confirmation, they are given eight business days to resolve that issue. So after the issue is resolved, they contact the appropriate government agency. A lot of time that will come back as an employment authorized. Sometimes we need a little bit more time to work on the case. So you'll see one of the AMBER responses. You need to review information, case and continuance. It might take a little while. Now, in some cases, you'll get DHS no-show, meaning the employee didn't actually contact DHS after they said they would contact DHS, or final non-confirmation, meaning we can't verify that information, information is not matching up. You can terminate an employee based on a no-show or final non-confirmation response from E-Verify. Um, so this is kind of how the system works. It still gives employees the way to fix the issue it's completely free. Some states, if your company has multiple locations in other states, some states have state mandate to say you have to use E-Verify. Or if you have a federal contract, sometimes you're required to sign up for E-Verify. Um, otherwise, in California, we don't really have any requirement for you to use E-Verify just yet. But I would tell you, even, um, California, we actually have the highest enrollment and usage rate of the E-Verify is really where we are. And also, we have a lot more STEM OPT students, optional practical training um, students. And a lot of time, they can only work for an um, employer who's participating in E-Verify. So if you have more interest in that, you want to find out more about the program, definitely let us know. Okay, the last program I want to go into before I share the resources to you is My E-Verify. My E-Verify is a, a, another free web-based uh, web program that anyone can use. Anyone over the age of 16 can go on My E-Verify, check their own work eligibility to make sure you don't have name issues, like um, you got married, but you didn't change your name with one of the agencies, um, or citizenship issues, making sure that your work authorization is actually valid. Uh, so you can check your own work eligibility. And you can create a My E-Verify account to lock your social security number. So if anyone's trying to use your social and apply to 
an E-Verify employer, it will give them a mismatch um, response back. And if they can't answer the security questions, then they can work using your social. You can also see a history of all the cases that have been created under your social security number. And that is very, very helpful in that we do get um, some feedback to say, hey, I didn't know my social was used with all these different employers that I have no knowledge of. Um, so that's another use of my E-Verify. That's the two programs I want to mention. And again, we have a more uh, a longer um, presentation on my E-Verify and E-Verify as well. Um, so that this is just a brief overview. The next few screens are just resources for you. Again, all these are hyperlinks when you get a copy of the presentation. It has um, navigation to our website, to the actual manual, where you can find a list of auto-extended employment authorization cards and examples of documentation. And again, like Barry mentioned before, I work for Outreach. This is part of, part of what I do. I do webinars. I go to live events. I provide training to employers. So definitely invite me if you have an event you want me to go to. We also process E-Verify logos. So if you want to have a logo on your company website to say, I E-Verify, you can do that. You just need to submit an application for it. We're also really very, very active on social media. So follow us on Twitter at E-Verify, and we give you information on what's changed recently um, and information about events that we're going to. So you can find us on Twitter as well. This is our customer service line. We have the highest customer service rating among all federal agencies. In fact, we just got our 2016 number back this month, and we're still improving. We're still having the best customer service rating throughout the years. And this is the department I used to work for before I start outreach program. So these two numbers here, employer and employee hotline, these are live analysts who are taking your calls. Um, and you can send us an email if you want things in writing. We respond to our emails within 24 to 48 hours. And of course, you have my contact information as well. If anything I can help you with, feel free to contact me. This is the last page of our presentation. I have to read it. Immigration law can be very complex, and it is impossible for me to describe every aspect of the process. This presentation is to provide you a basic knowledge information to help you become generally familiar with rules and procedures. For more information on the laws and regulations, please visit our website on your screen. So that is the end of my presentation. I'll turn it back to you, Barry. Okay, thank you. Uh, I hope everyone found this to be very informative. Um, and I will get the PowerPoint presentation out to everybody with the links in the next couple of days. Uh, and then we will take the recording of the webinar and post it on our private YouTube channel and we'll send you that link in a little bit of time. Uh, the gentleman that usually does that is on his honeymoon right now. He became my son-in-law last Sunday or this past couple days ago. Um, so as soon as he gets back, he'll post that. Uh, I just want to make one other comment, which is that uh, we always have these webinars every month and next month we're going to have a webinar or it's either going to be July or August with Nicole Minkow from Perlman, Borska and Wax. She's the head of the Labor Law Employment Law Department there and she's going to be talking about Department of Fair Employment and Housing um, investigation process. If you as an employer receives a discrimination charge and one of your employees goes to the DF EH, uh, what the process is, what do you have to do, how do you do it, what have you. Uh, she did a presentation I attended a couple days ago and she was wonderful and she agreed to do a presentation to our clients and friends. On that note, thank you again for being on the webinar today uh, and you Ting, uh, thank you again for the great presentation uh, and we'll go from there. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Barry. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone.